Let's bow our heads. Our loving Father in heaven, we come before you seeking a blessing. We have nothing to offer you except we have a great need. And we're just thankful that you always satisfy the needs and the longings of our soul. So send the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and our minds. Teach us good things from your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath to one and all. It's good to be back and uh, share with you. Uh, I always enjoy this time of fellowship. God is good, and it's interesting how things come together without any planning on our part. Uh, the uh, Carla men mentioned uh, listening to God speak, and uh, that's kind of what this topic is about today, listening to God, looking for evidences of His speaking to us, and He does it in a numerous ways, and we're going to review a number of those things from Scripture, but also just driving down the road on the way here from where we live over at Stone Ridge. What a beautiful place to live. <laughs> I love this time of year. You see the trees uh, on either side of the road. It looks like they're just lifting their hands and praising their creator, God. And it's just a happy time to see that we have irises growing out in front of our house right now. I just wish they last a little longer. <laughs> they're so beautiful and fragrant. And uh, it's just good to be alive. It's good to be alive in northern Idaho. Title of the sermon is Voices in My Head. Now, I hope you don't think that I'm crazy, uh, but uh, I think it's pretty common for us, all of us, to have voices in our head at times. And we're, sometimes it's difficult to figure out what voice is which. Is it mine? Is it God's? Is it Satan's? What's the source? How do we know? And so we're going to take a little review through Scripture here in a moment. But first of all, I want to share a, a, something with you that uh, happened to me recently. I went uh, on a little trip down to Texas to see my son, who lives in Dallas, and some of my grandkids that live there as well. And on the plane flight, about halfway through, it's a long flight, I wanted to put earplugs in my ears. And so I got them out and realized that it wouldn't do any good because I had hearing aids in my ears. So I had to take my hearing aids out. And I went, what am I going to do with these? And so I looked around and I had a little cellophane a wrapper that had some crackers in it where it was all empty and now so I put them in this little cellophane pack and uh, kind of folded it up and set it in that little basket in front of you on the seat in front. Well about an hour later uh, the stewardess came down the aisle with the bag. You've seen them do this I'm sure. And everybody was throwing things in the bag. You can probably guess where this is going. Well, I grabbed the trash out of, that I accumulated and I threw it in the bag, unmindful of the idea that I had previously put my hearing aids in that little cellophane bag. But interestingly enough, a little voice in my head told me I shouldn't do that. It was risky. I better not do that. You better get them out of that bag. But I put it off and then I'll do it later. Out of sight, out of mind. And mindlessly I grabbed the trash and put it in the bag. Well, just as we were coming into Dallas, I realized what I'd done because I was looking for my hearing aids. Oh, no. And I flagged down the stewardess and said, hey, I, I you know, put my hearing aids in the, in the trash. And I said, can I go look? She says, there are about 10 or 12 bags of trash in the back. And I would have delayed the flight and looking for them. So my heart sank, realizing that I'd lost my hearing aids. And they're quite expensive. 
Well, I learned a lesson about heeding the voices sometimes. It pays dividends, and it's going to cost me to get my hearing aids back. I don't have them right now. I haven't. Uh, I have to work out a, a new, I get a new phone. I have to get uh, to hook up to hearing aids that have Bluetooth, you know, the complications. So I've, I, I don't have them right now. So I have to ask my wife to repeat uh, several times. And if someone whispers in my ear, I can't really hear it very well. Well, lesson learned. Sometimes we need to listen to the voices in her head. And sometimes it can be dangerous listening to the voices in our heads. Um, let's take a look at what God did in speaking to mankind in the very beginning. What is the first thing that God said to this world? Where the, what's the first thing he said? What? He said, let there be light. Who was he talking to? Inanimate objects, right? And when God speaks, things happen. And you know, it's interesting that in the, in the beginning, when he said, let there be light, if you look it up in the original language, he repeated that phrase twice. It's not, let there be light, and there was light. It's, let there be light, let there be light. Exact same word. So what he did was, he squared light. Now, maybe you can follow me in this uh, little uh, formula that Einstein put together. E equals mc squared, right? So matter and energy are interchangeable. That's how they figured out how to make an atomic bomb. E equals mc squared. Well, right there you have in Scripture the formula for creating mass. You have the energy of the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, and God came along and squared light. Let there be light, let there be light. And there was mass. You see, that's how God does things. He does it in an orderly fashion. We follow along later and kind of try to figure out what He did. We don't know how He does it. But when He says something... It becomes reality, becomes visible, becomes tangible. That's how powerful God's words are. When he speaks something, it becomes from nothing. It becomes. Now that gives me hope and joy in my heart to know that he can do that with me. If he can do it with an inanimate object, he can certainly do it with me who am created in his image. So if we have problems in our life that we think that are overwhelming us, think again. When God speaks, good things happen. And they don't take a long time to happen. Sometimes things seem like they take a long time. But God speaks and it's fast. It's done. When God speaks, He has several purposes for what He says. But He doesn't mince words. He doesn't say a whole lot of things. Sometimes it's just a word or two or three words. When he talked to Adam and Eve, or Adam at first, it was just Adam. Let's take a look at Genesis 2. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. God laid down a basic law, a basic plan to make Eden perfect. There had to be a restriction so as to prove his autonomy or his independent thinking. He was more than a robot. He had to have reasoning processes, and he had to have a no, or there wouldn't really be any intelligent thought. So to make it perfect, God had to give him a restriction. And verse 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Period. He didn't go on and elaborate. He just laid down that law. 
of restriction. This one tree, don't eat of it, because when you do, you'll die. And in chapter 3, let's take a look at what happened. Chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm going to skip past uh, the, the rest of uh, Genesis 2 and go right to 3. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now where did Eve hear this command? Did she hear it from God? Or did she hear it from Adam? We don't know, it doesn't say. But I am suspicious that she probably heard this recited to her from Adam. After she was created, Adam says, well, here are the rules in the garden. and You're not supposed to eat of this tree. But did God say that you shall not touch it? Did God say that? No, it's not in the text at all. He just says, don't eat of it or you'll die. But she comes along when tested, and she adds to it. Now let me just create a a picture image here. Eve is curious. Wouldn't you be curious? Come on. When you're told not to do something? I know little children have a problem with this sometimes. I made this beautiful little airplane, model airplane, uh, out of wood in my shop. A little propeller and wheels. I should have brought it with me to show you. I'm really proud of it. It's a cute little toy for the kids. And I I came into the kitchen where my grandson was standing a few years ago back down in Dallas. And um, he was about three years old. And I said, Raymond, I I made this in my shop and I'd like to have, you can use it. I'd like to see you play with it. But here are the restrictions. This is heavy, made out of wood. It's not meant to fly. It looks like an airplane, but it's really just to be played with on the floor. It has wheels, and you can, you know, zoom around on the floor and and turn the propeller and make it a lot of fun. But don't throw it. And I handed it to him. Mistake. I should have laid it on the floor. But he took it and instantly threw it across the kitchen, banged into the cabinets, so up on a shelf high above where he could, couldn't get to it is where it went. And it's still in good shape today as a result of that. I told him exactly what he was not supposed to do, and that was exactly what he did immediately. Well, it wasn't instantly that Adam and Eve got to this point of the temptation. But that restriction in and of itself may have caused some curiosity But God built into our brains thinking processes that consider things. And we have these conversations with ourselves. And we know that there are positive and negative influences with good angels and bad angels. You've probably seen them where they'll sit on one shoulder or the other and whisper to us. And it's not exactly like that. But here we are hearing both sides of an issue, thinking about them, making decisions based on empirical evidence. And Eve was curious enough to wander away from her husband and out into the meadow that came nearby the middle of the garden where that tree stood. And she wasn't going to eat of it. She was sure that she wouldn't. But she wanted to take a closer look. She was curious. And so she walked a little bit closer to the tree. I'll use this as an example here. And she looked at the tree, and wow, was it beautiful. Sparkling fruit of silver and gold, and she could smell a fragrance of the, of the flowers that it also produced. And as she looked at this tree, she was startled to see one of her um, 
fellow companions in the garden. She knew this serpent, probably named it. We don't know for sure, but it didn't frighten her because they were beautiful and they, were, they would communicate and probably come and sit on them and wrap themselves around them in, a, in an affectionate way. So she wasn't afraid of this serpent, beautiful wings. And as she looked at it and looked at the tree, suddenly it started talking. Well, I would have run immediately, wouldn't you? If you heard some animals start talking. But apparently she was all the more curious when she engaged in a conversation with this animal, this creature that normally wouldn't talk. But this demon-possessed creature convinced her that because he ate the fruit, that's how come he could talk. So there's added benefits in, in this fruit. We don't know how long the conversation went on, but it certainly involved some thinking processes in her mind. And she had a plan. See, she didn't want to go against God. She didn't want to be deceived. Uh, and so she developed a plan. She took God's command and she enhanced it. She took God's command to say, don't eat of it. And she added, or don't even touch it. And so when she got up there and to the tree... Don't touch it or you'll die was her addition to the command. And so the snake, filled with the devil, got smart and put the fruit in her hand. So by her own admission, she'd already sinned. If she said, don't touch it. But she was still alive. And so she rationalized even further. And she realized that uh, there, there were three things that went through her mind. It was, looked like it was good for food. And this is in verse six, three verse, chapter 3, verse 6. It was pleasant to the eyes, and it can make one wise. This rationality went through her mind. The voices in her head said, Hmm, well, I'm not dead. It's in my hand. I may as well take a bite. I'm curious about that. And so she did. She didn't listen to the voice of God. She listened to the voice in her own head, the voice of rationalization and reasoning. This is what gets us in trouble when it comes to temptation. We think about it. We rationalize. We linger. We allow ourselves to be influenced to do something dead wrong, and we know it. And yet we block that out because of our own inner considering that goes on. Now, God says something after this event where Adam, and it's a whole other story why he did what he did. He knew what he was doing. She was deceived. He uh, considered her more important than God's command. He loved the creature more than the creator. And so he went along with it. He he said to himself, well, I'd rather die with her than live without her. Um, that's a whole other aspect to this. But look what God says next after this happened. He went looking for them. Of course, he knows everything that happens, right? In real time, God knows everything. He notices everything. Did you know that in him we live and breathe and move and have our being? And in him all things consist do you have any concept of how vast the universe is? This new web telescope is, is peering back into time and seeing how enormous it is. There seems to be no end to it. And yet he holds it all up. Every bit of it, from the smallest atom to the greatest galaxy. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to wrap your mind around that. So God knows everything. He knew every little... In, um, argument that was going on in their minds, all the anxiety that they were feeling. He knew exactly where they were, and yet he talks to Adam as though, hey, where are you? And uh, that's what he said. That's all he said is, where are you? 
I want to suggest that a lot of the conversations in our mind are involving that very issue. Where are you? You ever stop and in your mind you wonder where you're at? Where you're at with the Lord? Where are you at with other people? With your spouse or with your children? How do you stand, you know, in respect to them? Um, we're a combination of all kinds of things, emotions, and we're constantly wondering where we're at. Are you wondering how are you going to be in the time of trouble? You know it's coming on pretty quick. And I'm not trying to spell a, a whole bunch of... Um, or spiel about, a lot about that because we all know it. It's coming. It's coming sooner than, than later. Uh, the whole world is just about to fall apart. And in my mind, I'm wondering, am I going to fall apart? Am I going to make it? You ever wonder about those things? There's good questions to ask. Where, how do we stand? We're told in the Bible to check ourselves out. And so a lot of the conversations we have in our minds have to do with where we are, where we are in our Christian life. Are we just putting on a, a front? Is it just a facade or is it real? Are we actually being transformed into the image of Jesus? And God will allow circumstances to come to us to reveal where we're at, How, as he did with Adam and Eve. They were in a very bad place. They were running from God. They weren't running to God. They were running from God. They didn't see it like that, but uh, they did their best to cover themselves up. They found out. And it's interesting what he says to them. And uh, he's, now he's using judgments to come. He's telling them what's going to happen. Who told thee that thou wert naked? Verse 11, who told thee thou was naked? What? That doesn't seem to fit. Does it make sense? Who told them they were naked? Is they're putting fig leaves on. Well, didn't they tell themselves? Did, didn't they just realize that they were naked because they lost the robe of light? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee should not eat? You know, God wanted them to confess. He, he gave them an opportunity to confess, to repent. And what did they do? What did Adam do? He says, um, the woman you gave to me, she gave me of the, free, of the tree. And blamed his wife for bringing the fruit. Did she bring the fruit? Did she make him eat it? And, uh, and the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, <laughs> He's talking to an animal here. Because you has done this. Now notice how the first condemnation goes to the serpent. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon the belly shall thou go, and dust shall thou eat all the days of your life. It's, it's an extensive condemnation of the serpent. Was it the serpent's fault? No. But he participated somehow. I mean, this is not a moral being. It's a serpent. It's a snake. But because he was used as a medium in the process of fooling this woman, he's cursed. And the, the biggest aspect of the curse falls on the serpent to begin with. And in verse 15, that's one of the, it's the first prophecy and a very powerful one that we need to claim. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And praise God, Jesus came and bruised the head of the serpent. And this debate that goes on within us 
has been won, and the victory has been won through Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. I love this passage. And then it goes on to explain the impact. God explained the impact of their sins to Adam and Eve. The woman was going to be um, greatly increased in sorrow and pain and birth. Most of you women know about that. And um, it also says that the husband shall rule over thee. I'm not sure how that's, if that's still going or not. Um, <laughs> Uh, usually the husband is ruled over a little bit. Uh, you guys are smiling here. Well, yeah, that's a whole other subject. I won't get into that. But then Adam, he says, cursed is the ground for your sake, and now it's going to have thistles and thorns, and it's going to not produce like it could have. And then the sweat of the face shall bring out bread. And boy, many times I've thought about that, the sweat of my face when I'm earning a, a living as a builder. Yes, there is a big curse. And then God comes down in time, about 1,500 years later, and he starts talking to Noah. And what does he tell Noah? Noah. I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to kill them all. You know, all the breathing uh, animals, everything on earth is going to be destroyed. But the, he gives a lengthy description of how he's going to save life. The biggest part of this command in verse 6 of Genesis 6 um, down through verse 18, and He's going to save life. He spends all of this time describing the ark, the boat ark, and how you have to put three levels and how wide and how long and all the descriptions of the cages and everything and the window that's put in there and the door for the purpose of saving life. Even if it's a little bit saved. You and I are in the very exact same position in respect to the world. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And part of that message is implied that very few people respond. Now you're going to go out and you're going to hand out great controversies. And there's going to be some people that will accept them, some people that won't. But expect the majority of people to reject. That's just the way it is. There's going to be few saved, but precious few. And it's worth scattering those books like the leaves of autumn. I'm reading that book again now for I don't know how many times I've read it. I go through the great uh, the conflict series when I get to the end of Great Controversy, they start in Patriarchs and Prophets. Read through every year. Right now, reading about Martin Luther. And those stories are so encouraging to see someone stand up for their faith against a system of Satan's devising. It's a real eye-opening and an encouragement to read it and reread it. I'm always blessed every time I do. So I want to encourage you guys to get out there with your campaign and get those books into people's hands, even though it will be a few. Isn't it worth the effort? Amen. Of course it is. Well, God was trying to warn us, but also encourage us that if we follow his commands, he will save us. No matter what the obstacles are, he's going to get us through it. He will save us at last. And then Abraham, when he spoke to Abraham, I, I'm going to have to skip past some of these examples here. But I want to share this one, especially about Abraham. Abraham had sinned. He had shown a lack of faith in God in a number of ways. And his sin was so great that he had to be taught a very valuable lesson. And now Abraham had a special relationship with God that I don't understand. I want that. It's like Enoch had. 
He walked with God so close that it was closer to go to heaven than earth, you know, and he went to heaven. Abraham finally had his son after many years, after the promise. And when he followed God's command, he had the son that was the son of promise. And he grew up to probably in his teenage years. And then God comes to him one night and he says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. He adds that part there. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And that's Genesis 22, verse 2. I can't imagine how hard that would be. It's, it's impossibly hard. In the first place, those voices in his head. Is this God? Telling me to do this? Are you sure that God would tell you that? That's what the heathen do. We're commanded never to do anything. Thou shalt not kill. And the only killing was uh, allowed with the sacrifices, and that was part of their worship. Take a son. He didn't even tell his wife because he knew that she would stop him from doing it. He snuck out of there before the sun came up with the one or two of his servants and his son. Now they're walking, not just a day's journey, but three days' journey. Can you imagine what's going on in Abraham's mind all this time? Let's think about it. You think he's having second thoughts? Third thoughts? Conflicting emotions. Let me tell you a little bit of how conflicting those emotions were. Isaac was to be a burnt offering. That's what it says. Burnt offerings were treated differently than sin offerings, thank offerings, and different kinds of offerings. A burnt offering was, a, was an offering of dedication, of uh, dedicating the life to God, and on the Day of Atonement, that was the final sacrifice, was the burnt offering. And the burnt offering was treated, like I said, differently than the rest of the offerings because they would dismember the animal and take the fat off the organs and wherever they could find some. Reassemble the animal, take the fat and put it on top of the sacrifice and burn it. Now, he's thinking about that. He's not just going to kill his son. He's going to have to go through that. Is that horrible? It's the most gruesome, horrible thing you could imagine. That was in his mind for three days as he's walking toward that mountain. Talk about voices in his head. They were screaming out to him the whole time. I can see him probably weeping at every step he took. So he gets to the point where he's walking up the hill, and his son says, Dad, I don't see any lamb. We got the offering. I mean, we have the wood, and we have the, uh, the fire. But there's no sacrifice. And, and how did Abraham respond? God will provide. God will provide. And so they get to the top of the mountain. And he tells Isaac what's going to happen. And Isaac submitted. Beautifully. He loved his father, he trusted his father, and Abraham trusted God so much that he believed that if he wanted to bring him back from the dead, he would do it, and so he was going to follow whatever he was commanded to do, because he knew that voice was the voice of God. He didn't doubt it. It was difficult, it was tough, it tore him to his very soul, but he was going to follow through because God had told him that.
And here Isaac lays down on that pile of sticks, submitting to this process. He raises the knife, and it was, you know, the angel grabbed it and stopped him from doing it. And God said, now I know. Now I know. I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. This shows us a little glimpse of what God was going to go through when Jesus came and was sacrificed. Jesus was the sin offering, the burnt offering. He was every offering there is. And he went through a torment like that of the burnt offering. He was basically torn apart with the whippings and everything. And his father had to watch that. He couldn't look at sin, but he had to look at his son being tormented and dying for us. This tells us how grievous and how horrible sin is. And in our minds, we need to have a barrier against it. When Satan comes with his little sophistries, we need to push back with the Word of God and say, Thus saith the Lord, I will not eat of that forbidden fruit. I will not allow my mind to go in that direction because God said, I will surely die if I do. We need to look at sin as a death sentence and not as something to be toyed with or played with or even considered for a moment. We need to have a repentance, a thorough repentance from anything sinful. And when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, that automatically takes place. God will place that barrier in us, like He said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the serpent. I want that enmity in me. Don't you? I want to hate sin with a righteous hatred. Now, remember the discussion between Abraham and Isaac, and they talked about the sacrifice. It was mentioned, God will provide a lamb, or where is the lamb? It was talked about as a lamb, but what did they end up getting? A full-grown ram was provided. Remember, it wasn't a lamb up there. It was a ram showing how abundant God's forgiveness is. It goes beyond the lamb to the ram, the greatest of the sacrifices. The ram and the bullock were uh, very similar in that respect. Now, I have other examples. It's already after 12 o'clock. Can I go a little longer? Is that okay? If not, you can just... You know. Good potlucks here. I know. Samuel. Let's take a look at that. We mentioned his uh, conversation with God. Samuel, in verse, uh, ch chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Here am I. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about something that happened to me one time that was a confirmation and an affirmation in, in a way, and also a life saving experience. Um, Charles Lawson and I were uh, good friends and co-workers in a ministry back in the 1980s. And we would drive around the country to different venues, uh, Uchi Pines and uh, Loma Linda University and uh, different places and churches and do um, outreach uh, programs. And we were driving out through the barren wasteland of Kentucky, or no, no, Kansas one night. And we decided we were going to drive straight through from where we were to our destination back at Portland, Oregon. 
And so we traded off every four hours we would be driving and then the other person would drive and we'd lay in the back of my uh, Peugeot station wagon <laughs> and uh, try to get some sleep. I don't recommend doing this, but we were trying to save money on hotels and things. And in the middle of the night during my shift, about an hour into it, I just couldn't fight it anymore. I was so tired. And I went to sleep, driving down the freeway. And I was dead asleep. I didn't wake up until I heard my name called out. Not by Charles, but by an angel, apparently. He, it said, Vince, or Vinny, I can't think. Yeah, Vinny, that's my family, calls me Vinny. And actually hit me right on the forehead like that and snapped my head back. I was bouncing around in the ditch. Could have gone off and, and caused some serious damage. Charles, of course, is awake, awake now. He's bouncing around on the back of the, of the uh, vehicle. And, um, but I actually heard my name called out, and it was like someone slapped me on the forehead to, to wake me up. Now, I can't say I've heard a voice like that very many times. That's the only time that I can recall, but it was as clear as a bell. It happened. And, of course, at that point, Chuck took my uh, place because he wasn't going to sleep again the rest of that night. And I remember I wasn't going to sleep either. <laughs> we both were praising God for he, he saved us out of that condition. Sometimes God has to speak real loud to get our attention. And sometimes he has to whisper to get our attention. God will do what it takes to get our attention. Sometimes with a loud voice. A slap along the side of the head. But it's all in love that God does these things. And right smack dab in the middle of uh, the messages that John the Revelator was given, we have our call as an identity, a unique call as God's remnant people in Revelation chapter 14. This is a very familiar passage. Let's take a close look at it. Can you give me 10 minutes? Are you, how hungry are you? I just, I'm a little hungry. But give me 10 minutes. It might take that long. John, uh, in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. I'm just going to read this. And, it's, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. And, and it gets kind of crazy here. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. Which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Have you ever had a problem with this? We're preaching the three angels' messages, and right smack in the middle of it, eternally burning hellfire. Have you ever been able to explain this comfortably to someone? <clears throat> I hadn't. It bothered me. So I went to the Lord on my knees and I asked for an explanation. And lo and behold, I'm going to share it with you now. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest. In the Greek, it means 
Also, it can be interpreted, nothing to remain. And they have, now that does not make sense. And they have nothing to remain, day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. No rest means also it can be interpreted nothing to remain. They're going to be ashes, completely gone. That's what we believe, isn't it? The state of the dead. And yet right here, there's a challenge to it. But look at the original language and it changes it. It greatly changes it. And you can show this to anybody. It's right in the concordance. Just pull it out and say, well, these words were mistranslated here. No rest, day or night. That implies this, the smoke of their torment ascending up. And smoke is the evidence of saying that something that happened in the past. Right? The fire, the, rem- the memory of what that, hap- that that happened, that sin happened. Is it ever going to leave us? We're not going to dwell on it, but will it ever leave us? No, because Jesus will have the marks in His hands. The scars from the thorny crown and a mark in his side from where he was pierced. Those are going to remain. The memory of what sin cost will go on. But only in the context of love. Not in the context of a torment day and night. See how different that is? But notice how there's a loud voice twice. There's three angels, but only twice are there loud voices. You ever wondered about that? The first one is loud, very noticeable, Creator God. Trust God the Creator. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Then the second voice is not loud. Why not a loud voice the second time? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Has there ever been a time when Babylon was not fallen? By definition, wasn't Babylon a pagan belief system? So it's in a fallen state, right? But now it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And look it up in the original language, that means to alight. Fallen is like a bird with the talons and it comes down and alights on the prey. That's what it's saying. It's on the move because it made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath that fornished. In other words, the unity of the world in favor of this Babylonian system is why it's on the move. That's what it's saying. But it's not saying it in a loud voice. It's saying it just to us to understand what's going on. We're the ones that this second message is is targeting to. When you see the whole world uniting under this papal movement, it's because the whole world has united that it's given the power to do what it's going to do. Do you see that whole unity coming together right now? I mean, we're on the verge of these things. It's only God holding those winds back until we can get in and do a little more distribution of books and other outreach tools. Wouldn't it be nice if all these seats were filled? That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? But more than having a whole bunch of Adventist churches added to the ones that we've got, 22, 23 million people, God wants a movement that exceeds that so far we can't imagine. The churches can't fill, can't hold all the people God wants to put in in fellowship with us. And believe me, our work is not going to go out with a whimper. It's going to be a loud call and people are going to wake up and join the movement. Millions of people will, I believe. There's going to be a great harvest. God has been planning this for eons of ages. I want you to think about something. Think about this. How long has God had to deal with sin? 
How long? Well, since Satan rebelled in heaven, we don't know how long ago that was. It was quite a while back when it began. But before it began, did he know it was going to come? And if, when you know something's going to come, does it stay in your mind? Does it give you some things to think about? So forever, God knowing everything, God has had to deal with this. Think about what God's going through. And if that doesn't motivate you to submit a little bit quicker and to love him more fully, I don't know what would, but God has suffered forever. He has suffered, knowing what was going to happen, and then dealing with it. Don't you suppose there will be this great collective sigh of relief throughout the universe when it's finally done and over? Oh, yeah. I want it to be done in my life, don't you? I just don't want sin anymore. I don't want to have to sin and repent, sin and repent. I want to move on from victory to victory. That's in my heart. That's the voice in my head saying, you can have victory. Grab it. Run with it. There are three things I want to mention in regard to these topics. We need the, to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. This is the way, walk ye in it. Number two is that we need to be listening to the right voice in our heads. And how do we know that? Compare everything with Scripture. And what I've shared with you now, you go home and get your concordance out and study your Bible and see if these things are so. Don't trust me. Trust the Word of God. We need to trust and obey for there's no other way. You know the song. I love that song. To be happy in Jesus. I'm going to leave you with a story about, I don't know if I've told this before, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll tell it again, and some of you weren't here then anyway. So I don't remember what church I tell stories in, so forgive me. There's a story of a burning uh, apartment building. This guy was awakened in the night to the sound of fire engines and alarms going off, and he was up about the fourth or fifth floor in this big apartment building, and he went to the window and looked out, and he, he could see flames, the, the um, orange, blue, or orange and amber color of uh, flames, but it was in the glass across the street reflecting it was on his building. He looked up and he saw flames, and looked down and he saw flames in the building. And he didn't know what to do. He started... He started to go out the door and down the hall, and he was hit with a big billowing smoke. He couldn't go because uh, the staircase apparently uh, was on fire. And so he went back into his room and he thought, wow, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's 50, 60, 70 feet to the ground, and, and uh, maybe I can make it. I don't want to burn to death. And so he started climbing out the, the window, and he heard a voice. He said, No. Go back into the middle of the room. And he said, wow, that's weird. Where'd that come from? But he thought, okay. And so he went back and he stood in the middle of the room. And it got a little more smoke came in the room. And he had to get down on his hands and knees because the air was a little cooler down there. And he could breathe a little bit. And he... he uh, went over to the window again in desperation, and the voice said, no, go stand in the middle of the room. Go back to the middle of the room. And he went back there and obeyed the voice. And then a voice came to him and gave him some hope. He says, now go over to the bed and make a rope out of the bed sheets and tie them to the, to the register, heat register, right by the window, and throw them out the window. He said, now that makes sense. Now I'm getting somewhere. I'm going to climb out that rope and uh, get saved that way. And so he began to climb out the rope, and a voice came to him a third time and said, No, you go wait in the middle of the room. Said, well, I've followed it thus far. I keep, keep going. And he went back in the middle of the room. 
He waited for a few minutes, and at last the voice told him to go and go out the window. So he went and he started climbing down and grabbed the knots that he had tied in the bed sheet and got down toward the end of the, of the length of his rope. And he felt some strong arms grabbing him around the legs. The fire truck had seen that flag of the bed sheets out the window and they'd moved the stair, the uh, ladder over there just in time to get a fireman up there and to grab him to safety. Little did he realize <clears throat> that the timing had to be just right. That's why he had to wait. Even though it didn't make sense, even though that voice was, seemed like a crazy thing, he followed it because he, somehow he trusted that voice. Probably the voice of his, of his angel. By the way, when we get to heaven, you know we're going to recognize our voices? That's kind of an awesome idea, isn't it? So, unfortunately, there were 27 other people in that apartment building that didn't make it out. A lot of them did. And some of them didn't. Was God speaking to those other people? Or were they just not listening? I think that's the way it is in this world. God is speaking to everybody. We can recognize His voice if we have a habit of listening and following that voice. We will know that voice. We can trust that voice. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to trust and obey. Trust and obey. We can trust Jesus. Someday we're going to have to run to the mountains. We'll be fed with, by ravens or manna somehow, but we're told that our bread and water will be sure. Don't worry about stockpiles of food and things. God will provide for us. He'll get us through this. Um, and don't worry about the questions that you're going to be asked about your faith. Your faith is growing day by day, and someday we're going to be called to Senate hearings. Who knows? We're going to have to answer for our faith. But in the very hour that you need to answer, you'll be given what to say. Yes, it's going to be like a divine teleprompter right up there. And we'll see in golden letters the words that we should speak. That's what happened to uh, A.T. Jones when he went to the Senate hearings about Sunday laws. They wouldn't let him take his notes, and he saw them on a banner behind the people that he was addressing. He was told what to say. We can trust God through whatever comes our way. We're going to make it. We're going to make it out of this world into a better world. Are you ready for that? Boy, I, every morning I'm more ready. <laughs> I just said last night in our worship time, I said, I'm so looking forward to that new body. <laughs> you know, this one's breaking down and it's painful. That's the least of my concerns, but um, we have a glorious future waiting for us. And all we have to do is say yes to Jesus and keep saying yes to Jesus and no to Satan and his devices. God speaks to us with warnings and judgments he wants to preserve life. He gives us a still small voice. He gives us a loud voice. He shows us things to come. And he has the greatest love imaginable for us. He loves us more than life itself. And we should love him back, don't you think? Let's bow our heads. Loving Father in heaven, we're grateful beyond grateful for what you have done and are doing in our behalf. I pray that you will teach us how to know your voice and not um, get into great debates over one thing or the other, but just keep our ears tuned to your voice to know where to go, what to do, what to say, how to receive the great truths that you have for us and how to share them with others effectively. 
Lord, we want to be used. We don't want to be set aside. We don't want to miss out on the great glories that you have shown us that we shall have someday. We want your love embedded in us, Lord. Come into our hearts today and stay with us throughout the Sabbath hours and beyond. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.